And Democrats appear to be heading into a second Donald Trump term with no clear party leader, no real plan, and no consensus on how this week's election went so wrong for them. But it's not just them. It's also an entire co cohort of anti-Trump Republicans who are asking themselves, what now? Joining us, New York Times opinion columnist David French, among those who are asking what now. Uh, David, really good to have you. Y you're right in the, in the op-ed section of the Times yesterday. You're less interested in exploring why Donald Trump won. What are you more interested in exploring, if not that? Yeah, I, I think it's much more what next. I think that is the much more interesting question than why he won. I think the why he won is is pretty obvious and pretty easy to state. I mean, he was running against a president who had a big inflation problem where the border had not been under control for about three years of his presidency and when there were two hot wars waging around the globe. That's a tough, tough environment to run in. So that's much less an interesting sort of, uh, that's much less of an interesting analysis than the question of what do you do now? What is it that happens next? And to me, that's where there's two principles that come into play. One is protect the vulnerable, because one of the elements of the Trump plan, when we're beginning to talk about mass deportations, attacking his political opponents, weaponizing the Department of Justice, there are a lot of vulnerable people in this country who are going to need protection for their civil liberties. And then the other thing is, Speak the truth. Understand the truth and speak the truth. We're living in a world where there's an enormous amount of disinformation and misinformation, and that is not only corrupting our politics, it drives us apart as we live in different silos. I, so one of my points is we need to speak the truth and know the truth. No, I hear what you're saying on that. Um, who's listening to that? I mean, <laughs> I'm serious. And how do you reach the people? Because there's an argument to be made that if anybody was watching traditional media, it would be hard to vote for Donald Trump, given just the, the cacophony of voices who were saying the guy was not only unfit, but dangerous. I mean, his own major uh, aides were saying this. Generals were saying this. People who were closest to him, who watched the, him, were telling stories about what he did or tried to do while he was in office. So I'm not sure that, you know, speaking truth, where do you speak the truth? Who's listening? Well, yeah, that's a great question, Katie. So look, you're correct. If if readers of newspapers were the only voters, Trump would have lost. There's polling data that indicates yeah. that. But, but where are people getting information? And that means that people like me, for example, need to be thinking creatively about how do you get out of our own bubble? Where do you go? And so, you know, you had Donald Trump speaking to Joe Rogan. You had Donald Trump speaking to people like Megyn Kelly and others. There is an entire media ecosystem in which that that I think people who are defending American democracy, trying to uphold the rule of law, need to dive into that ecosystem. You don't just leave it out there and say, well, if only we can get our headlines at The New York Times exactly right, then everything will be OK. No, we need to, of course, do our jobs at The New York Times as well as we possibly can. But we also have to creatively think about go where people are. You go where people are and speak to them where they are and, and through the mediums that they're viewing. And this is not easy to say that and to do that are two different things. But I do think it's absolutely necessary because we cannot continue with this siloed information environment. And so it requires creativity, energy, and you know, not too much navel gazing. Do you think it was a good idea for Harris in retrospect to be going out there with Liz Cheney? Was that a was that a winning message to motivate Democratic voters or, or independent voters to go to the polls? And I and I asked that because turnout was way, way down. Yes. No, I mean, there's no question that in my mind when she was doing that, that would be something that could be a tipping point in a very, very, very close race. I don't think there was any credible argument that going to Liz Cheney would shift millions of votes because that's overall what you were talking about uh, that she needed to do eventually. No, that would be in a very, very close race. I think that the fundamentals of this were very negative for her. Um, she was not helped by Biden staying in for so long. And things like should she have talked to Liz Cheney or should she have gone on Joe Rogan's podcast, those are rounding errors in this election. But I think if you're talking about going forward, how do you sort of begin to bridge these divides and bring people back onto the same page means over time you do have to do things like go on Joe Rogan's podcast. You do have to do things like go on to alternative media. That's a longer term cultural project. If you're talking about would have changed the outcome of the election. 
if she had Liz Cheney on stage or not. No, no, it's it was going to come out the same way, given what we now know. Um, one of your colleagues, Ezra Klein, was arguing that part of the issue that the, that the Democratic Party has right now is that they haven't been a Big Ten party, that they have pushed people out of the party and they've actively, actively rejected some people based on, you know, those people not having... Um, I'm not going to say it as, as eloquently as him, but not having the right beliefs or the, the party line beliefs. And, and he mentions Joe Rogan as somebody that the Democrats should have been engaging with much more frequently, but, but pushed him off to the side, believing that he was fringe. Oh, I think that is absolutely correct that, you know, there's a my my one of my other colleagues, Michelle Goldberg, has this great statement that she said, uh, movements need to be le seeking converts more than hunting for heretics. And if you are hunting for heretics, you are shrinking your tent. If you are seeking converts, you're expanding your tent. And by the way, seeking converts means having a more open heart. It means having a more tolerant approach to people. When you're hunting heretics, you're closed, you're furious, you're angry, and you're off-putting to people, in particular, when you're asking people to sort of swallow their concerns about the direction of the country and vote for you anyway, because the other guy is the greater threat. But so I, I do think absolutely you cannot be a movement that's hunting heretics. You have to be a movement that's seeking converts. See, this is why I don't work for New York Times opinion. I'm not as eloquent as all of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, David French. Thank I appreciate you, it.